Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Americans for Peace Now webinar. I'm Ori Neer, and with me is my friend and colleague, uh, Karen Paul. Karen is APN's development director. Hi, Karen. Hi. Uh, and we're really happy to host today our friend and longtime APN board member, uh, Letty Coton Pogrebin. Before we introduce Letty and really delve into this conversation about shame and secrecy, I will remind you that like all webinars, today's webinar is recorded. You will find the video recording probably sometime tomorrow uh, on our YouTube channel and the audio sometime later today, hopefully, on our podcast, PeaceCast. I will also remind you that you are invited to ask questions. You can do that by using the Q&A tool that that's the bottom of your screen. We ask that you keep your questions short and please again use the Q&A tool and not the raise hand tool. So uh, Letty Coden Pogrebin is an author, a journalist, an activist. Um, I would say, you know, on a personal note that her energy and creativity and dedication and intellect are truly an inspiration uh, for me, for, for us at, at, at APN. And I know that it goes much beyond uh, she is a um, longtime member of APN's board of directors and former chair of the board. She is also a co-founder of Ms. Magazine and a leading activist uh, focusing on feminist causes and on Jewish causes and Israeli affairs. And in addition to the numerous articles she has published, she's also the author of 12 books, 12. Uh, most recently, she published the book Shanda, this book um and uh it's it's uh, it's titled shanda a memoir of shame and secrecy well so with this introduction lady it's a pleasure to have you on an apn webinar thank you for joining us oh thank you i feel i'm at the family table well very much so yeah. for the kids table yeah <laughs> so Lady, can you start by telling us what motivated you to write this very revealing book well, I started writing what I thought was going to be a conventional chronological memoir. And after about ooh, 50, 60 pages, I realized I was outing <laughs> my family because everything formative in my life um, traced back to a secret, a secret I found out about when I was 12, um, the ever increasing revelations of secrets as I got older and um, I sort of see my life as a feminist and a journalist uh, rooted in some way in this peeling back of the onion and figuring out the truth of a, about a situation that may look different on the surface or may have be, been presented in a way that was let's say face saving. In my family, we were at, we were an immigrant family. Everybody wanted to be real Americans. People wanted to get rid of their accents, uh, learn to cook the American way. So, you know, they stopped making these wonderful stuffed cabbage uh, creations and started making jello with fruit molded in it. It was not an improvement, but it was a way to fit in. You wanted to present a, a flawless face as a family in whatever community you were in. If you were in a an impacted Jewish community, which I was, as, as well as um, reaching out into the real world through my public school life, um, you were being watched all the time by not only your fam family members, but your community, your synagogue, fellow synagogue members, everybody was judging everybody. So as a result, a lot was hidden. And um, as I looked through my manuscript, I realized that I was talking about the formation of character by fear of the Shanda. And that sort of was became my true line and then that became my title. Thanks, Letty. It's a, I just have to say what a pleasure it is for me to be in conversation with you. I've read you much of my adult life. Um, Thanks, Karen. Yeah. And I'm there's- so You're part of our team. You've been terrific. Thank you. Um, there is a Shanda corollary 
with the American Jewish diaspora relationship to Israel, right? For decades, we've held back talking about the things that we find off-putting or wrong about Israel or shameful. And there was the dirty laundry issue. We don't talk about it outside of the family or we don't talk about it at all. Um, so given where things stand today, how do we convince those who still find it difficult and, and traitorous sometimes to talk about Israel's many challenges to recognize that we must call out the things that are happening, the terrible things that are happening. Well, it's a it's a kind of a pedestrian um, axiom that friends don't let friends drive drunk. And to me, Israel is not a friend. It's a it's a relative. It's a cousin. I was eight years old when the state was uh, made official, but my family was very active as proto-Zionists in during the issue of period. Both of my parents, but especially my father, who was the president of everything pro-Israel you could be the president of, plus the Jewish war veterans, the men's club, everything else you could be the president of. And uh, their goal was to raise money for Israel, raise the profile of Israel, and establish that we were associated with an enterprise that was going to fulfill um, the promise of being a light unto the nations. When instead we do dark things, and when we feel we need to hide the underbelly of Israeli society, or in the case, in my case, it's all about the governments, it's not about the people. I love the people, I love my Israeli relatives. It's about the governments who have distorted what I consider the dream of the founders and who have betrayed the promise in the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel, which if you read it, you would you wish as an American that our constitution uh, was as all encompassing because it in includes sex and nationality and ethnicity. It's the only thing missing from there is LGBT rights. TQ rights. Uh, but I think we are uh, enamored of, of the Zionist dream more than the Zionist reality. And as I speak around the country about this book, which is a very Jewish book, so I'm speaking almost entirely to Jewish or, or audiences, people raise their hands and say, I am ashamed of Israel. What am I going to do? What can I do to help to, to shape up this government and to show how Diaspora Jews are uh, suffering a deep disappointment. Israel um, has always been presented as the Jewish state and the state of the Jewish people. And many um, many of the great demagogues of the past or, or great orators, let's put it that way, of the past, have said, you know, this is the state of the Jewish people. It's yours as much as ours, even though we don't live there. We send our dollars there. We send our heart there. We send our prayers there. We feel uh, that Israel is family. And when Israel goes off track, I'll just give a couple of examples of right now what's making me and others ashamed. The fact that there are bills pending in the Knesset just introduced that would um, segregate women in, in maternity wards, according to Arab and Jewish. If you've ever been to Hebron, Hebron, you are appalled to see segregated sidewalks. I was appalled when I was there. We spent a day there, <clears throat> or you will remember. Um, and it was apartheid in the streets. There were sidewalks that you couldn't walk on. If you were Arab, and the, I watched Arab women carrying babies having to climb up on the roofs and then down because they couldn't get to their homes on the sidewalks that would have taken them there. Um, Jews Jews could drive in, Arabs couldn't drive in. You had to go on foot. This is not an equal society. This is not what we envision, where um, you know it's a it's a land for quote the stranger as well as 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 us. Um, so I hate to I hate to experience the shame. I hate to feel it. I hate to have to answer for it. Uh, I, I wouldn't have thought it came to this, although Peace Now has been working, you know, for three decades, at least I've been a part of it for for three, more than three decades, to um, enliven a, a, a notion of uh, 
intergroup harmony and now of peace and two states. Instead, we feel as if we have gone backwards. I, I sat on the White House lawn. I watched that handshake. I watched Clinton's arms around two sworn enemies. And, and Arafat still in the kafia, wouldn't give it up. And I thought, okay, I can die now. You know, everything I've worked for, it's coming to pass. I watched members of the, quote, organized Jewish community meet in the in the nearby, I think it was the Senate office building, uh, to work on cooperative projects. I felt as if nirvana was at hand, and it's all devolved into hatred and racism and fascism. So, so Letty, can I follow up on something you said there, which was when people meet you and hear and listen to you um, as you're speaking around the country, they ask you, what can I do? What do you tell them? Well, I tell them, first of all, to go to the Peace Now website, of course, uh, the APN web website, because we're always offering uh, invaluable resources so people can educate themselves. Let me say something that I hope doesn't insult anyone who's listening, but it is a little shocking to hear some Jews speak so authoritatively who have never stepped foot in an Arab village, have never been on a, a separation road, have never witnessed uh, water resources in the disparity that they exist, swimming pools in the settlements, trickling public water, pigots and spigots in the Arab villages. People who've never stepped foot in a refugee camp, who've never talked to a, an Arab uh, Palestinian who is exactly like us in terms of aspirations, education, family values, uh, customs, many customs, many eating customs, humor. So has never felt the brother sisterhood that I feel with Palestinians that I know has not humanized the other and yet has such a strong opinion about how bad the Palestinians are and all of them are wearing suicide belts and they wanna throw us into the sea. Um, what if we judged America on the Proud Boys? Wouldn't you talk back? Wouldn't you speak about who Americans are that you know and our values as we learned it growing up? Or would you let the neo-Nazis represent us? And would you let anyone get away with that? So when I speak, um, I defend the reality I know. And some of it's really painful for me as a Jew to have witnessed what I just described in some of the villages and certainly in the refugee camps. Um, and some of it is simply, you know, a love fest. <laughs> so to me, that's what being a Jew is now is, is balancing both and representing um, as best you can, the best of, of Jewish values. So if, if I may, I want to follow up on the follow up by, <laughs> by asking you what 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 it does to you and what it does to your friends to you know all the good people who are on your weekly um uh, newsletter and so on that you send out uh, this you you refer to Israel in your book as a soulmate which i thought was a really interesting definition yeah. when you have a soulmate when when you have a situation where the value system of that soulmate is drifting so far away from yours what does it do to you and what, what do you hear from, from people around you about, about that? I, I get nourished by people that we're in constant communication with at Shalom Achshav. I get nourished by the vision of 100,000 people in the streets who are uh, protesting and, and demanding uh, that Israel be true to its its essence, what I, I consider its essence, which uh, I know that, you know, Benny Morris has exposed, again, the underbelly of the 1948 war. war. But um, that doesn't mean that there wasn't uh, an ideal that we all, when we had trees bought for us at our bat mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs and birthdays and holidays, those trees represented um, planting a little of our each of our souls in, in what used to be called the Holy Land. Um, 
what I call Medinat Yisrael, the state, the state of Israel. And when the state goes wrong, when your soulmate uh, is so off, off the derech, <laughs> in the derech, the, the path I consider uh, worthy and admirable as a Jew, and we're coming up on the High Holy Days, and we're looking deep into our souls. It's a, we're doing a cheshbon nefesh, a, a, a an accounting of the soul. And the question is, how do you how do you support a government? You're not supporting Israel. At this point, you're supporting a government that is doing reprehensible things, that is dividing people, that is creating a, the, a, 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 a theological uh, um, entity that is ruling on the uh, behavior of every population group. Um, should you not be able to take a train on a Saturday? If you're not an Orthodox, a Haredi, why would an Arab, why would a Christian, why would a secular Jew want to support a state that denies you the right of transportation, the right of free travel? It's just insane that um, um, American Jews would have to apologize for and excuse behavior that's so antithetical to the values we protect so assiduously here. Before we continue with the uh, questions that Karen and I prepared uh, uh, before the conversation, I wanted to just remind you that uh, you're welcome to ask your questions. You can do that at any time uh, by using the Q&A tool that's at the bottom of your uh, screen. Um, Letty, now that you- I just written... need to say, Karen, before you go to the next question. Sure. And Israel takes up two chapters of my book. <laughs> so if people are interested in shame and secrecy in their families, in their personal lives, um, and their head is just splitting from the terrible things happening in Israel, skip those chapters. <laughs> just read the other ones. Uh, but I do want to- in, engage everyone listening in the fact that there are things you can do. Uh, go to Peace Now's website and you'll see we, we have, uh, in fact, a kind of a, a mini agenda for how to address our legislators, how to, uh, you know, deal with things like writing letters to the editors, how to educate your own local group about what's really happening there. You know, when you grow up on secrets as I did, you become very, um, dedicated to uh, peeling back the surface, as I said earlier. And when you peel back the surface and when you allow in the truth of what's happening, not just in your life and your family's life, which is again, what we're doing now in the Yamin Nora'im, we're looking at our lives. We need to also look at the, at the state we love, which is our own, and the next state we love. Uh, issues of loyalty have always been very iffy and uncomfortable when anti-Semites accuse Jews of dual loyalty. But in a way, everybody comes from somewhere and they have a little special affinity for their the country of origin of their antecedents. I am very proud of my of my people, and I'm very proud to be associated with the Jewish state, but only when it's got a government I can be proud of. Okay, we're going to go back to Shonda, just as you just Thank as you. we talked about before. Um, so now that you've written all the secrets about your family that you've held for so long, have you felt the catharsis around it? And is there anything that you, I mean, not that you need to reveal it, but is there anything that you have held back on revealing because it's still too hard to talk about? Um, the end of the question really is simple. I have held back nothing. I, my aim now is to lead a secret free life. Mm -hmm. It took me a very long time to get to the point where I could write the first chapter of this book, which is the secret that was the hardest for me to reveal. But I feel so free and so light by not having to carry it and worry about what will people think and who knows, who did I tell, who didn't I tell? Uh, you know, it's just a very arduous process to keep a secret. I write in the book about the influence on me of an old friend, Alan Alda, the actor who I met uh, 50 years ago when we were both working on Free to Be You and Me. 
the family entertainment that was originated by Marlo Thomas in 1971 and two. And uh, we, be Alan and, and our, Alan and Arlene and their family and our family have been friends for 50 years. So um, when he went on television to admit he had Parkinson's, he did that on morning TV. I was stunned. I called him up and I said, how, how did you, how did you make yourself do that? He'd been, I knew he had it for three years. He'd been hiding it very well. He had the tremor, but he kept it, you know, out of the camera's view. And I said, why did you do that? You didn't have to. And he said, I did have to. I knew someone would, would expose me. I didn't want to give it to the gossip mongers, the gossip columns, you know, the people magazines of the world. I wanted to control it. And and that's how I feel about um, the revelations that I've made about my life. I think they are instructive for many, many people's lives. I can go into a few of them if you like, the personal ones. But he kept saying, I feel light. It was baggage. It was too heavy. And it allowed me to write that first chapter in which I admitted an illness that I was really ashamed to have. Of course, no illness is your fault. But the particular um, infirmity that I had was a brain tumor. And if you were raised in a Jewish family, as I was, you didn't have to be beautiful as a woman. You just had to be smart. And when I was told I had a brain tumor, the terror that hit me was I was going to lose my mind. Brain was my mind. And I, to, to my, in my own self, my image of myself is of an intellectual. It's not of a beautiful person, a beautiful woman. So um, I was hiding it because I felt that everything that I value about myself would be in question from then on and that people wouldn't give me writing assignments or speaking dates or that people my friends my close friends would be watching me for what when I forgot a word or a name or I happened to stutter about something and I would suddenly not be smart and I would if I wasn't smart it was it would be like a, who am I um, who am I if I can't speak and I can't write and if people don't perceive me to be somebody worth listening to? The tumor turned out to be benign, thank God. It had to be removed surgically. But I still could not admit it. I just couldn't, couldn't, I couldn't let that secret go until I talked it over at length with Alan and had a few other very deeply meaningful experiences with my Rosh Chodesh group. That's a first of the month group of women who are very Jewishly educated, who discuss issues of interest to Jew Jews and in our case, feminists. My Rosh Chodesh group helped me a lot to feel I could put it on the page. And once I put it on the page, I made it the first chapter. I got rid of it. I was like free, I was free. And as for the other the other people in my life, um, hi, can you go around that way, Ruben? Thank you. The other people in my life, I oh, I didn't write about anybody until I asked their permission. Everybody in my family, my cousins, I was one of 24 cousins because my parents on each side were one of seven. Those were the early families. I mean, they were, my father was born in 1900, my mother in 1901 or two or four or five. She lied so much. I don't know exactly what her birthday was. That was one of her secrets. Um, and each of them not only authorized me to write about the secret that I knew about, they offered me a secret I didn't know about. And all of them felt, just as I do. Listen, we're so old now. What are we? What are we holding all this stuff in? It isn't even a shanda, you know. Um, I'll, I'll give you one quick example, which is that one of one of um, my aunts. Uh, we always felt very sorry for her because she was barren and um, post-war in, in the 
you know, a post-Holocaust period, a woman could not, not have children. I mean, you, it, you owed it to, to our people to replenish our numbers. And we felt so sorry for her because she couldn't. She told us, she told the women in the family that she was barren. In, and that was in 1946. I was only six or seven years old, 1946. But in 1968, um, when I had my son, David, um, I was very careful not to talk about him. And, you know, he was in a little box and we were at a, a family Seder. And it was our custom in our family to not talk about children or to keep children away from my Aunt Joan so it wouldn't hurt her feelings. And here she was. We were sitting down, both of us eating chocolate-covered matzah at the end of the Seder. And she keeps talking about little David, who's uh, way across the other side of the living room in a little box on the floor, just having been born on a April 17th. And this was a Seder of a few days later. And I said... I, I, every time she would say how cute he was and how did my twin girls respond to him and she's talking constantly about children and I'm more and more uncomfortable and I'm talking about the chocolate covered matzo and isn't it wonderful that Barton's or Barasini is now making such dark chocolate instead of milk chocolate I'm trying to distract and she finally grabs me by the arm and says Letty stop that stop you can talk about your children I've had two abortions. I said, what? Are you kidding? She said, Herbie and I did not want children. You couldn't tell anyone in your family we didn't want children. It wasn't allowed to not want children in 1946 when we got married. So I made up the fact that I was barren and it became my secret and people stopped hawking me a china about getting pregnant. So the, what that's what the secrets do is they reveal how many times we falsify ourselves because we have to for the sake of convention. Oh my God, what a story! Um, yeah. I, and anyone who's on this webinar who knows me and and Ori and Letty, you know as well. The the story of a brain tumor is very close to home for me as well, and so I understand that's a very moving. And thank goodness you're okay, and um, and that was. And you're okay. Healed. Well, no, thank goodness you're okay. I'm, my husband died from brain oh. tumor. So, mm -hmm. um, so I know, but I also know those fears. I know those fears very well. Um, so just as a follow-up question, have there been any unexpected gifts that you've, you've realized accompanying the release of these secrets and, and yeah. also any relationships that have changed as a result of them? And, and if my, if I may add just, just a quick one, you mentioned earlier that it was such a great feeling to be um, free of of shame and guilt and and so on. Uh, why is it? Why is it so important to or free of secrets? You said actually that's what. I, so why is it? Why is it so important to you to to be free of secrets? Uh, secrets can can be can can play a good role sometimes. No. Well, I I I feel we own our own secrets. We have we have no right to reveal other people's secrets again unless we. We do so for a reason and get their permission. Uh, I want to be free of secrets because I never had a secret that was something that wasn't based somewhere in shame or a sense of inadequacy. What, that, why, why? That's what I was hiding. In, in my case and in every case in my family, what we were hiding was something we were ashamed of. If you're hiding some somebody else's secret, like your roommate. Uh, is engaged and and you and her and her fiance came on to you. That's a whole different kind of secret, right? And you need to really sit very carefully. Am I going to tell my roommate her her fiance came on to me? Is it my is it my place to do it? But what if she marries this guy and look at what he just did? You know, that's a very whole different thing. I want to be secret free. I don't want to be shame free. Um, and there's a big difference to me uh, between shame and guilt. Um, shame, shame somehow is corrosive. Uh, shame is uh, essential. It's about who who you are, who you feel you are. Guilt is about something you did. Uh, you know, we don't say uh, we say I'm ashamed. We don't say I'm guilty. 
unless we're really guilty about something, about something. Because, you know, you, you stole a loaf of bread because you're hungry. You're not ashamed of that. Really, you shouldn't be. Les Miserables is the story right there. Um, somebody raped you. You're not ashamed. You shouldn't be ashamed. You're made to feel ashamed. Um, if you're hungry and you steal, I mean, it seems to me um, there's a much bigger story at stake, obviously. And you should never be ashamed of something that was done to you or the fact that you were oppressed or you were abused. Um, you see the you see the difference in the language. And when I asked a, a, a cousin of mine who who is a huge, like six foot four inch, ruddy faced Irish um, Protestant, um, if he felt a difference between shame and guilt, he said shame is when my mother said, shame on you and did this with her fingers. And I never got over it. I felt there was something wrong with me. Guilt is when I feel guilty because, you know, um, somebody threw an extra apple in and I didn't pay for it. I'm guilty, but it's not a, I'm not ashamed of myself. And that's such a big deal. Um, and so what I got out of this experience is the stories of others that I didn't put in the book. Originally, I was going to put in a lot of other people's stories in it, but it just got too unwieldy. So in my talking about the book, and I've done well over 100 talks in the last year about this book, and I continue to do so, and I'd be happy to appear at people's book clubs if, if they want to get in touch with Peace Now and put them in touch with me, I'll be glad to do so. Um, what I've discovered is people want to tell me their secrets. If I do it in person, they come up to me, they line up, they buy a book, and then they say, you know, you know I like to just tell you that you think that was bad. <laughs> and then they go on and they tell me something they feel is worse. I've also been astonished by the number of non-Jews who have identified with, with the Jewish story. They're mostly immigrants from immigrant populations who, like us, wanted to make it an, in America and be real Americans. Uh, young people today are culture proud, it seems to me. Uh, many of the uh, newer immigrant groups are, are hanging on to their, their culture with pride. In um, my, my generation and my parents' generation, we wanted to get rid of it. My parents wouldn't let me learn Yiddish. When I wanted to go to Europe <laughs> with my parents, they said, why would we want to go to Europe? We got away from there. You know, Why would we ever want to go back? the memories they had were not um, prone to sentimentality and nostalgia. <laughs> so it's a different uh, immigrant generation now, but young people still have a lot to be ashamed of. Oddly enough, even though they're out there on, this, on social media, they're exposing their lives in ways our, our older folks won't would consider violations of privacy. Um, but there are still enough things for them to be ashamed of that they fear cancellation. They fear being found out about the things that in their uh, constituencies are supposed to be secret. So um, I, I want to start taking questions from, from the audience, but I thought maybe a good segue to, to doing that. As you can imagine, most of the questions we have have to do with a very few uh, with with the content of the very few uh, pages of your book. Uh, but what I wanted to ask you is to uh, take a, a step back from the book for a moment and talk a little bit about your activism. And what I wanted to ask you specifically about that is how your political lens transformed over the, the many years of your being an advocate for, for various causes. Um, and I'm, I'm speaking mainly uh, because the activism environment has changed so much. Uh, we're talking about political polarization and social media, which you just mentioned, and so on and so forth. If you can just talk a little bit about how how that has changed as a result of the changing of the environment. Yes. Um, well, I, I have been an activist for over 50 years, literally, you know, a kind of street you know, street action activist, as well as a writing 
at, at activist, as well as an advocate behind the scenes, you know, as well as an organizational joiner and a founder of groups when I don't find a group that I feel quite says it the way I want to make change. I found one, I start one. <clears throat> and I have been part of uh, Black Jewish groups, which have enhanced my understanding of, quote, the other in deeply meaningful ways and informed my politics in, in a dramatic way. And I've also been part of several uh, Jewish-Palestinian dialogue groups that have done the same for me on our issues. Um, I feel that the street actions have not had the effect recently in this country that they are having in Israel. So maybe they have uh, their their activism, you know, uh, through line is in a younger place than ours. I, I marched um, with the what the pussy hat march, a million people. It didn't change Trump. It didn't change the Congress. It didn't change anything. The only thing that changed was the vote, which is why the right wing is so intent on um, voter suppression. So I no longer feel it important to sign petitions, which I used to, or march. I mean, I'm still, you know, I'm 84, but I can still run, run, run and walk. I just don't think it does anything. And I would only go if it's a matter of being there and, you know, body on the line, counting the numbers. The numbers matter. But they don't matter that much. A million people didn't matter. And the same thing in terms of Afghanistan and, and the Vietnam War. I mean, what mattered was changing <clears throat> who's in charge. So that's one thing. And I hope that doesn't keep people out of the streets because we still we still need that part of our activism, but it, it doesn't do it for me. Um, I still think letters to the editors matter, even though, you know, it's stuff is online. I find I rate, read the Times letters section with more avidly than I read the, uh, the opinion page. I like the colloquy that happens on the page or on the screen. Um, I think grassroots stuff matters more than national. The large Jewish national organizations don't, don't represent me for the most part. I do it issue by issue. I don't do it, you know, big collective Jewish activism. Um, I also target my money. I stopped giving uh, to UJA when the when the uh, UJA Federation in New York when when the funding went over the green line. I just didn't feel and and I think you know you can account for it, we'll keep it differently, but I know it's being done over the green line, and that was a violation of my of my deepest principle that we need to have two people ruling each other and not try to blur the line. Uh, the boundary, actually make a boundary, create borders. Um, I'd like them to be permeable, but I'd like there to be borders and, a, and, a, and a, a, a state that's contiguous for the Palestinians in some way. So that that's an answer to, to that. Um, I feel that the more that the, that the mainstream Jewish community creates radioactive words, the more we have to say them. We have to speak racism in Israel when we see it. We have to say fascism when we see it. We can't paper over what's happening in that government that is so loathsome and, and uh, anti-other, <laughs> anti uh, as well as divisive, so divisive. Um, it makes me, my heart hurt, really. I mean, I have a physical reaction to every everything I read in the, in the paper. When I read that, that there's something, just been um, a proposal, a bill proposed in the Knesset that would punish rapists and abusers who were uh, Arabs or nationalistic more than Jewish abusers and rapists, it just made my blood cur curdle. And as somebody said, does a 12-year-old victim of rape care if she was raped by a Haredi man with a beard or, or by somebody with a beard and a kafiyah? I mean, what's the difference there for her? It's a victim. It's not the, was it a nationalist act 
that needs punishing. That's insane. Yep. So we, it's interesting. There were quite a few people who reacted to the distinction that you made between uh, the Israeli government, the Israeli people. Uh, one of them I actually wanted to read out to you and and then, you know, uh, ask you, maybe sharpen the question a little bit. So um, this, this uh, person writes, I loved your book, and I'm so grateful for your voice on this issue. Your words are bringing tears to my eyes because I have witnessed, the, witnessed apartheid. Uh, one question I find hard to reconcile, though, is... How do we explain that the people who are the ones who elected those governments? In other words, and, and this, this reflects a couple of other questions that were asked, uh, saying, let's not forget that the government, which I abhor as you do, uh, was elected by a lot of people. And the, and the rift that we are viewing, this kind of uh, ethical rift, is not just between um, you know, progressive American Jews and the Israeli government, but also um, pretty broad sectors of uh, Israeli society. Yeah. Um, I remember in the old days when I first was active in, in Peace Now, and I will say Mark Rosenblum was the person who recruited me, and, Mark, and we're honoring Mark this year at our gala. And we wouldn't exist without Mark. He was intrepid and inspired and um, indefatigable. So... Um, he got me in and I remember my discomfort because when you ask what's the arc of my activism, I was as uncomfortable as any Zionist kid about anything critical of Israel. I mean, I had to get out of that mindset and look at facts before I could really throw myself into peace now. Um, you know, the, the other had been generalized to be suicide bombers, and the other had been generalized to not want us to have a state and to, you know, want an end to Israel. And I didn't know that there was, you know, any sort of middle ground where we could have not everything, but enough to give us our own autonomy, identity, freedom, and freedom from fear as well. And so, when I got involved, I took comfort in the fact that there were so many people in the Knesset who were Peace Now people. I, I felt really comfortable because there was, we were on the outside working, you know, at, at extra parliamentary ways. And on the inside, there were people in Merits and there were many other, you know, there were smaller parties. And I think there was, uh, um, at that point, um, what was the what were the three that got together in merits? It was Ratz and Mapai and Shinui, right? And they all had their different, you know, rationales. Ma -pam. Ma -pam. And yeah. Mapam, oh, Mapam. And and uh, I liked the idea that there was an inside and an outside. Now I don't feel there's an inside. Um, I don't have that feeling. So it's harder for us because we don't feel ourselves reflected inside the government. But I mean, that's the case when I look at our government, I see Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, that's the case when I see um, <clears throat> the, the, the extremists who, who, are, who are mouthing the most incredible conspiracy theories, including, you know, hers that Jews sent, I don't know, missiles or something that created the forest fires. La laser, yeah, la laser beams. <laughs> laser beams. Um, so now I think, you know, we have to gather the strength uh, of our convictions from ourselves. We can't say, and we have members of Knesset who are inside there fighting this fight. You know, we have some, but not a lot. And we have to be able to feel protective of the ideals, not necessarily the party, not necessarily the person, uh, but not lose sight of the, the uh, mission. But that whole, I want to say it's a holy mission, but I don't want to get it all mixed up with theology, but I happen to be a believer. And I, I think, you know, God is weeping at this. A, a member now of the, of the government, I forgot what envoy he is, met with a, 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 a fascist who denied that the Holocaust was a big deal. You know this minister, or Ori, whoever uh, this envoy of what what department he he is from. 
But the, the idea that a member of an Israeli representing Israel would meet with somebody who had said the Holocaust is not a big deal. Why? For what purpose? Some kind of self-interest that I'm I'm lost. Yeah, I think you're referring to the Israeli ambassador to Romania. Who, uh, yeah. Yeah. And who met with somebody who is from what what kind of a um, neo-Nazi type party, right? right? Right. Why? What is going on here? And so you you can't um, look for cover, is what I'm saying, by saying anymore. You can't say that anymore by saying, and you know, more than half of Israelis disagree with this, this, or this. Maybe they don't, but maybe we don't agree with you know more than half of what this country is, our country is doing. It's such an interesting analog now. It's almost a historical irony that both countries, uh, uh, you know, even though uh, Hillary Clinton got three hundred uh, more, mil three million more votes than than um, Trump, everybody says, "Look, the country voted for him." Well, it's the same situation now. <clears throat> yeah, the country voted for him, but for for them, but for a, a lot of different reasons, most of them of self interest. And, you know, this shouldn't be a country driven by self-interest. That's what's wrong. And neither should Israel. Uh, Karen has been waiting patiently to ask a question. Before you do, Karen, just a real quick thing. Uh, one is some people are asking how to get in touch with Letty. I think the best would be to do it through me. So send me an email, onir at peacenow.org, and I'll put it in the chat in a moment. And the other thing, just before we continue, because I don't want this to be lost in the many other questions that are here, uh, a comment that I think you'll appreciate, Letty. Um, this isn't a question, uh, it says, but I can't help ex exclaiming that Letty looks 20 years younger than 84. I heard her mention being six or seven in 1946, but I was still very surprised and her being 84, what a beauty she is. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you very much. But as I said, I never grew up... <laughs> feeling beautiful i felt smart and please just say you think i'm smart <laughs> oh. we think you're very smart that compliment i was raised for that compliment <laughs> but i appreciate you for that uh saying that thank you i always say feminism keeps me young because i just i always feel this energy to make things clear that would make life better that's my job i um um, so, uh, Gloria Steinem once called me the great popularizer. That isn't, you know, like a, a bad word. It's a word that uh, for somebody who makes things clear. I try so hard to make complicated things clear. But thank you for the compliment. Thank you so much. Well, that's a perfect segue to my question, Letty, because what I wanted to say to you is that you've been such a Jewish feminist lodestar to so many of us, including me on the young adult Jewish journey. Deborah Golda and me was kind of my primer as I was figuring things out. And you've been involved with, so, as Ori has said before, you've been involved with so many social justice movements over the years, but particularly in terms of being Jewish feminist. Well, what do you say today um, to the young women, young women and their relationship to the world, and perhaps especially young Jewish women and their relationship to the community and to Israel. Um, I'm going to start with an image that I think is a measure of the problem, and that is so many women start out by speaking, uh, sp start speaking by saying, Somebody's probably already thought of this, or I may have missed this, but, or um, this may not be exactly accurate, but, and then they say what they think. There's always a little bit of self-shaming, self-protective, I, I might be wrong, or I might not have a right to speak, or maybe I'm talking out of turn. I so desperately want women to screen that out and just speak. Own, own your own thoughts, your own opinions. Feel the power that comes from that ownership and then you'll act. Um, educate yourself about what you're passionate about. If you're pro-choice, be ready 
to argue with anti-choice people, get down and dirty in the streets in those arguments, be clear about your advocacy. Don't let anybody catch you ill-equipped, have the data. Um, and I think that that's my message to, to today's young feminists, be it Jewish feminists or any feminist or any woman, is we have earned the right, our lives, I don't care how young you are, you've earned the right to speak your own narrative, to uh, witness your own experience and, and share it, to make demands on the culture and society, because you're going to live a lot longer than I am, and you need the world to be ready for you and responsive to you. And again, about Israel, I mean, I worry about the young women in Israel who are simply going to be uh, um, reified in their second-class citizenship because though Orthodox Judaism talks about the uh, sexes as complementary, meaning this one does that and it's yin yang and you know we did our roles. The bottom line is you're not going to have the freedom that you should have in a democratic state if if this theocratic government. Uh, holds and extends its agenda. It's not a hidden agenda. It's an out there agenda. So if you pay attention, you can see the future. Um, I think we have time for maybe one quick question. So um, I will ask this question. If you can give us maybe kind of quick pointers. Uh, I was really intrigued in, in the book you, you write about, um, you make a kind of a distinction between uh, destructive shame and what you call constructive or pro prophylactic shame. And I just wanted to ask if you can give us maybe a few pointers about how one can find the right balance between between those two. Well, I needed uh, to give you a, an example of what I mean by um, positive and negative shame. I mean, negative shame is just the kind that, that destroys you, is devastating, you, you feel you're worthless. And for some reason, you or somebody else has talked you into the fact that you're, you know, at your core, you're a bad person, or you did such a terrible thing, it's unforgivable. Um, positive or prophylactic shame is, is that second thought that makes you say, um, I need to go back and I, I put it so simply in the book, I can't drop a tissue. I was pulling out my phone when I was taking a fast walk in the in Central Park and the ramble, the ramble is very woodsy. It's like a mountain, in, you know, in the middle of New York, a little little mountain in it. Um, and no one was behind me and no one was ahead of me and no one was around me. And it was um, a weekday. And when I pulled out my phone, my tissue dropped and I was walking, you know, speed walking. And I just stopped and went back and picked it up and noticed it that I'd done that. And even though it was the tiniest little act, I said, I did that. No one was watching. No one was going to know if they came in the tissue that I'm the one who littered. God's watching. But even if I weren't a believer, I couldn't live with myself. I just couldn't live with myself. I was shamed into going back and picking up the tissue. And the same thing happened the other day when... Um, I passed somebody who was struggling with a map in Central Park. It wasn't another, it was a couple of weeks ago. And I was hurrying by and I heard that they had an accent and I stopped and I said, may I help you find something? Because if I had just walked on by, you know, I would have been one of those New Yorkers who like, you know, not my business. And I stopped and I said, may I help you find something? And these are the things I shame myself into doing. I consider it prophylactic shame. And of course, there are many more important ones that I don't have to share. <laughs> so a recognizable face has joined us, <laughs> our chair of the board. Uh, Jim, I'm just going to turn off an alarm. I'll be right back. Sure. Jim, this is your big chance. <laughs> yes, now. <laughs> I should do this quickly while she's out of the room. <laughs> yeah, no. Listen, this... Uh, I, well, she's back, and now I, now I have to be careful. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Jim. <laughs> Hi, Letty. Uh, you know, for all you who are watching this today, uh, you can tell that having Letty as a board member is just a, is not only an honor, but a treat. Uh, you know, we, we get her, her wit and her wisdom and her humor 
and her serious activist side, sometimes with a sharp tongue, uh, which is good because we're all honest with each other. That's one of the great things about APN. But listening to you, uh, Letty, uh, was reminding me of, even though I was raised in the Midwest and my parents were first generation Americans, my grandparents were the refugees in the uh, early 20th century, uh, what we shared in common. My parents always talked over our heads with Yiddish. Mm -hmm. They didn't, you know, we were not gonna learn Yiddish. And when they didn't want us to know what they're talking about, it was Yiddish. <laughs> and uh, also- Their uh, secret language, Jim. Excuse me? It was their secret language. Yes, it was their secret language. They had decoder rings and everything else went with it. Uh, and, um, and we were both, uh, what I call Sunday school kids in the uh, in the fifties and sixties and and whatnot, which is both good and bad because certain things came out of that that she touched on, where we were all pitching all the way for uh, for for Israel at that time, which was absolutely the thing to do. They were under attack; and they had just come into existence. Uh, but there were a lot of secrets there that we didn't know. And uh, and the other thing we shared, not at the time that we, we were kids, but it ended up being that way, was our, our good friend and founder, Mark Rosenberg, uh, who we're all thinking of now because he's uh, going to do some medical procedures and knowing Mark, and I was talking to him the other day, he talked secretly because they wouldn't let him talk on the phone in the hospital, but of course he was gonna do it. And I had to kill him to keep, Get off, get off the phone and just get well and, and eat well. Um, but we also experienced uh, the things that gave us uh, ultimately uh, very much concern. I think we, uh, all of us here, and, and I'm very proud of everybody who I work with uh, at not only my, my board members, you can see by our, the people who who make it run every day, like Ori and like Karen, uh, how proud we are and our, our, our leader, our president and CEO who can't be with us today because he's doing something, always doing something important and in our, in our cause. Um, but what, what, we, what we really experienced that brought us all together was watching an Israel come into creation and fighting like hell to help it get there. And then 67 came along and the world changed. And we were old enough at that point to start to recognize that what we were pushing so hard for all of a sudden had another side to it. And it was the, uh, it was the start of the occupation uh, leading to what human rights groups today call a state of, our, of uh, apartheid. And, and now we, uh, we've come across something that's even darker, which is the uh, government that came into existence last year. And you can see how the Israelis have reacted to it with all those, that demonstration that's going on. Uh, they're trying to steal their democracy and they're not putting it up with it. They, in my estimation, they have to bring the, the non-Jewish Palestinian, uh, Israelis, Palestinians and other Arab people and others in with them, and I think they'll do that. So I think there's there's some hope there, uh, but at this point, putting it in uh, Letty's lexicon, uh, what is happening now is both a shame and a disgrace. And we hope that you will follow her lead and our lead and join us in this cause because they're on a, on the verge of annexation. Uh, and we have to encourage our government to make sure they don't do that. So help join us in doing that. Uh, and in doing so, you honor Letty, uh, who deserves all the honoring she can get whenever. <laughs> thank you. And, uh, and thank you all for joining us today. And, and thank you, Letty. I love you. Uh, thank you, Jim. Love you, too. And Ori and Karen, thank you. And I, I want to just give a shout out to the Palestinians who watched. I really am grateful. Um, I try to familiarize myself more and more and more with 
that community. And I think it's important for um, Jews to do that more often. And I appreciate Palestinians who tune in to ours. Thank you. Thank you, Letty. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Letty, for sharing Shonda with us. Many of the people, many of our folks who are watching today will, will be getting a copy. So we're very grateful to you for that. Um, I hope that everybody had a chance last night to see the super blue moon, which means that in two weeks we'll be at a new moon and we'll be at Rosh Hashanah. So we wanted to say goodbye with an early Shana Tova to everybody. And thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. And I can say that rather than bother you, or people can contact me through my website, lettycottonpogervin.com. You have enough on your plate. <laughs> and I'd love to hear from you. Bye. Bye. Bye.